I want to sort of flush out some of the general differences and similarities between uh, two of them and also try and then zone in in a bit more detail on, on Southeast Asia as a sub-region first of all. I'm also aware I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, on the territory of two um, sessions in the afternoon here, one which is dedicated session on uh, HADR. I think that's from a US perspective, so I'm not going to cover what you've done. I'll allow others who've, uh, who've done that and know more to, uh, to cover that. I'm really looking at it from a regional uh, perspective. Um, and then as I'm based in Southeast Asia, if in the time remaining for questions, if any of you have any questions of a more general uh, maritime nature, South China Sea related, uh, I'm very happy to take those, um, although this is quite a broad topic as it stands. So as I say, they're not the same, but they're often kind of grouped together of uh, sometimes rather pejoratively regarded as the low-hanging fruit of defense uh, and, and maritime security cooperation in the region. Um, Four guiding questions, which I hope will give a bit of focus uh, to my talk. One, how important uh, is Southeast Asia as a region uh, for SAR and HADR cooperation? Secondly, how developed and relevant are regional frameworks for maritime cooperation in these fields? What is the role for external powers? And what is the wider significance? So, um, I'd say they're unarguably both important and growing requirements. The requirements from small-scale disasters to search and uh, rescue for small vessels are, are often local, uh, falling within the scope and scale of national capabilities in Southeast Asia. It doesn't always require outside assistance, an obvious point, but one I want to make up front. Uh, Southeast Asia, um, however, is an extremely diverse area in terms of the size and, uh, and capabilities of the countries involved. Um, and that obviously makes for a very uneven mix, depends on, on, depending on whose waters you happen to uh, uh, be passing through. Uh, and that can demand um, uh, major international responses, disasters. Uh, I think many of us have heard the metric that the wider Indo-Pacific region is one of the most disaster prone, and Southeast Asia exemplifies that, uh, regularly suffering large-scale flooding, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, severe storms, and of course sea level rise as a kind of uh, a background concern affecting many of the, the countries whose populations and food growing areas are uh, mainly in the littoral. Um, recent incidents, I think, uh, underline the uh, importance of this and have also pushed them up the profile of regional organizations. Typhoon Haiyan, or Yolanda, uh, in the Philippines at the tail end of uh, 2013. Uh, the search for MH370, still ongoing, more than a year after its disappearance. And more recently, the uh, successful search for AirAsia flight QZ851. Uh, these, of course, um, not really search and rescue, more search and locate operations. At a basic level, I'd say there are a few challenges that are in common to these activities. One, uh, the availability of assets at the national level. As I said, Southeast Asia um, varies very wi uh, widely in terms of what national uh, capabilities there are to offer. Not all countries there are equipped uh, to deal with natural disasters or to conduct a search operation at sea. Secondly, uh, there's a need for internal coordination at the national level. This is a recurrent, chronic problem, you might say, in, in parts of Southeast Asia. Um, Indonesia leaps to mind having uh, no fewer than 12 agencies with a maritime uh, purview uh, and getting them all to uh, uh, cohere to a single uh, voice is, is, remains a, a mission in progress, although I think there has been recent progress on that, as the Air Asia um, search demonstrated. Um, thirdly, how to manage the politics of international cooperation. And there are two elements to this. One's within ASEAN, which is the regional grouping. Uh, there are elements of prestige involved. Who hosts what matters, and uh, that competition uh, can derail uh, cooperation within ASEAN itself. And then, of course, the extra-regional politics, where you have the much larger, more capable <coughs> maritime powers. India, uh, US, Japan, uh, China, uh, South Korea, to name a few. And then fourthly, another challenge which has been actually kind of flushed out by the, uh, the experience of MH370, uh, uh, aero and maritime SAR regimes at the international level. Uh, 
um, are not uh, are not fully aligned. That's one um, one challenge. Um, but it, both of these activities, HADR and search and rescue, have in common that they're primarily uh, civilian-led activities. Well, we shouldn't forget, uh, in a context where we're discussing uh, the Navy and primarily uh, military response role, it's important, and naval forces, for reasons of their mobility and flexibility, uh, do feature large, uh, largely in both of those, um, in a first, but largely in a first responder role. So how you coordinate between the civilian and military arms is, again, uh, a, a common uh, basic challenge uh, at all levels of, uh, of HADR and, and SAR. Um, Typhoon Haiyan uh, in November 13 highlighted the shortfalls in capacity of Southeast Asian states to respond collectively to large-scale disasters, whether man-made or natural. Uh, Haiyan was not the first major storm uh, to wreck the Philippines. It won't be the last. Uh, and also, it didn't uh, cause particular damage elsewhere. It wasn't a transboundary disaster in, on the scale of 2004 uh, tsunami. Nonetheless, it seems to have nudged Singapore and other like-minded uh, regional states to embr embrace a more institutionalized regional approach towards coordinating HADR uh, efforts across Southeast Asia under a single roof. Uh, and that's in the form of Singapore's fairly recent proposal to set up the RHCC, a Regional Humanitarian Coordination Centre, and I'll say a bit more about that later on. Concerning SAR um, and search and locate, the precedent value of MH370 is less clear than Haiyan. Uh, it's such a, a freak event, maybe it's, uh, it will be a, a unique uh, outlier. However, the loss of AirAsia QZ851 just a few months afterwards uh, has pushed search and rescue uh, collaboration higher up the regional agenda. And as I say, I, I would take the latter as more of a, a qualified success at two levels. It demonstrated that Indonesia, after some initial coordination problems with different data being released by different uh, agencies and the military and the civilians also, in some senses, vying with each other for um, who could do more, uh, more quickly. Uh, it did, in the end, after a high-level uh, intervention from the president, I think, um, do relatively well. Secondly, we also saw uh, Indonesia and Singapore, who've had recently a rather scratchy maritime relationship, um, be able to cooperate. And it was actually a Singaporean uh, submarine search and rescue vessel that got the signal uh, about the, uh, that located the, the fuselage of the missing jet. Despite these overlapping common challenges between HADR and SAR, uh, at the operational level, these missions do remain functionally distinct. Um, another difference at the international level uh, concerns the international frameworks, the treaties, the conventions that, that govern this. Um, I'll just say a word about SAR, first of all. There is an obligation written into the relevant international treaties to cooperate across borders, across sovereignties. The 1979 Maritime SAR Convention is the main one, not the only one, uh, and it requires parties to establish rescue coordination centres and sub-centres and common procedures to aid cooperation. It also stipulates, and this is a quote, that parties should take measures to expedite entry into the territorial waters of rescue units from other parties. And I'll return to that as a potential sensitivity later too. Um, for civil aviation, if an airliner goes down, the response of, from the initial rescue effort uh, or, or recovery to the post-accident investigation also is likely to straddle several nationalities. Uh, and that's all covered by uh, the Chicago Convention and other international frameworks. One of the major lessons of the search for MH370 is that need to align the regulatory frameworks for aero and maritime search, uh, SAR. These are not currently harmonized, and that can be obstructive uh, when the search cuts across air, surface, and subsurface domains. Maritime SAR is also governed by other frameworks, including obligations written into UNCLOS, the UN Convention itself, uh, and one of the oldest conventions, the Safety of Life at Sea, which in its first version dates back uh, to 1914. Um, national search and rescue uh, regions are defined according to um, the International Aeronautical Maritime Search and Rescue, IAMSAR, manuals, and Global Maritime Distress and Safety uh, System. That's a global level regime, and it's, it's quite mature. 
By contrast, HADR uh, is um, the obligation of an affected state to cooperate with other states and NGOs offering assistance can be, can be considered as more of a moral than a legal uh, obligation. Uh, the notion has, this notion has been challenged by the uh, emergence of concepts such as R2P, um, responsibility to protect, which seek to inter internationalize uh, international humanitarian norms. Southeast Asia also provides a good counter example to that. If we wind the clock back to 2008 and Myanmar, which suffered a devastating cyclone, Cyclone Nargis, uh, when the military dominated government actually uh, refused to accept direct military assistance, um, from, uh, particularly from Western militaries. And it took some time and a bit of uh, diplomatic leapfrogging in which ASEAN played a role uh, for an indirect um, route of delivery to be found via Thailand. Now, you could say that the Myanmar response was an extreme one, given the xenophobic nature of the military government of the time. But it does underline that HADR, I think, is an inherently more sensitive area uh, for outside and especially Western military involvement. Uh, basic distinction, SAR occurs mostly at sea, uh, so it may be in your territorial water, territorial waters, but it's, it's not on land, except if, um, urban search and rescue, which is associated with earthquakes. Whereas HADR predominantly, although the assistance has to arrive by sea and by air, the activity takes place on land, and that means boots on the ground. And that can rub up still, I think, against some uh, local sensitivities. Um, that caution is often ascribed to boiling down to lack of trust um, issues or prestige or the xenophobia in the case of the Myanmar authorities. I think we also need to recognize that there's a fairly basic core meaning of sovereignty here that a country of government needs to, if it can, grapple with an emergency through its national means. And it's a last resort, really, that leads to the outside uh, being called in. Um, and I think we see a similar reluctance uh, to seek outside help for, 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 for many states, uh, not just those that are um, uh, politically uh, non-democratic in orientation. Some of those states with the frailest infrastructure in the Philippines and, and South Pacific Islands leap to mind um, are obviously uh, uh, now or more or less on um, permanent call for uh, outside assistance. But I think we can draw a distinction within Southeast Asia Countries like Vietnam, where in fact a legal change would have to be made before a foreign military could operate on the soil uh, as uh, offering, if not an obstacle, but I think a potential factor that needs to be borne in mind rather than assuming that we are all somehow uh, gravitating towards a new uh, paradigm. Uh, Indonesia too can be rather prickly uh, in the same uh, uh, manner, notwithstanding the fact that in 2004 it did make that very groundbreaking decision to admit large-scale foreign military uh, assistance to an area that we shouldn't forget either was still a, a zone of active conflict in Aceh. So those are the kind of general differences and similarities that I see between uh, these two fields. Now just to zone in a bit more on the, on the uh, questions. First of all, how important is Southeast Asia? Well, I think this is pretty easily answered. It's a very dense area for shipping. It's a center for maritime commerce. Uh, you've got the facts, I think, that many of you already know that the Malacca Strait carries almost a comparable volume of oil to Hormuz, 50% uh, of the world's uh, seaborne trade passing through the South China Sea. Uh, therefore, search and rescue is, is really more than a regional issue. It's, it's, a kind of, it's linked as a core part of uh, the economic smooth functioning of a, of a global trading system at that point where shipping is so concentrated. That's maritime SAR. Um, and then we also have uh, this unique pattern, really, within the wider Indo-Pacific, if I can introduce that term, Southeast Asia of uh, 10 countries, 11 if we include East Timor, some of whom really cannot operate um, independently when it comes to uh, even a fairly small-scale disaster, uh, and others like Singapore, which despite its small size, obviously in terms of uh, capabilities, uh, is at the, at the high end and comparable to a Western country. Secondly, um, how developed uh, are and relevant are regional frame, frameworks for maritime cooperation? 
Let's take search and rescue first of all. As I said, this is already governed by a, an existing quite mature international framework. But um, for those who don't know, search and rescue responsibility can go well outside your territorial seas, your exclusive economic zone. Um, in the South China Sea, Singapore, again, despite its small size, uh, has over a million square kilometers of, uh, of sea space over which it is responsible primarily uh, for uh, search and rescue. And to move the focus out to uh, uh, the uh, Eastern Indian Ocean, Malaysia's uh, SRR also projects out about 450 nautical miles. That's well, well beyond its uh, EEZ into the Andaman Sea. That said, although there is this theoretical division of labor, in practice, uh, effective search and rescue cooperation still requires um, political will as well as capacity. And several Southeast Asian countries have not signed the, the Search and Rescue Convention, probably reflecting sovereignty concerns over territorial waters. And you'll recall that earlier quote about uh, accepting uh, rescue access into uh, territorial seas. Moreover, I think the Search and Rescue frameworks that apply uh, within the, the Malacca Strait, for all its importance as a busy shipping thoroughfare, are not yet fully effective. Among Singapore-based um, maritime uh, bodies, we have a couple that I'll single out. One for anti-piracy, RECAP. The United States is also now uh, a contracting party to RECAP. It has its information sharing center in Singapore. Why do I mention that? It's not technically related, but nonetheless, the ability to leverage of, um, of that on shipping network as kind of private sector eyes on the water and to kind of crowdsource uh, that as, a, as a, an asset uh, in the search for MH370 was, uh, was um, proved to be uh, effective, not effective in finding the aircraft, but nonetheless in getting buy-in from the industry, and also the Information Fusion Center, which is another multilateral, uh, multinational, um, largely naval body, which again uh, has a broader maritime security brief, goes beyond um, uh, piracy, and that gives it, I think, a, a better remit for... Uh, for this kind of activity. Regional cooperation on military SAR, which I'll say a brief uh, word about, because that's obviously a, a, an important but sort of discrete subset of search and rescue. Um, although it's a running template for military exercises, multinational exercises within Southeast Asia, uh, it's also constrained by security factors and duplication of capabilities. Um, there have been cases in Southeast Asia where requests for uh, military SAR have been uh, refused between neighbours and that gets to the uh, political uh, frictions that still uh, impose a glass ceiling on how far this cooperation has proceeded. But I'll highlight one, I think, notable exception to that. Uh, that's um, Singapore has concluded bilateral submarine search and rescue agreements uh, with Indonesia and with Vietnam in 2010 and 2013. Uh, these Navy-to-Navy -Navy agreements reveal that I think sufficient trust has been built uh, between like-minded Southeast Asian countries in what is, after all, a pretty sensitive area. Now, the counter to that is the fact that Malaysia has chosen to go the other way and acquire its own independent search and uh, submarine search and rescue capability. So that shows that there are also limits on, on how far capability pooling uh, has matured. <coughs> HADR cooperation has become, I think, a, a linking theme uh, throughout the wider Indo-Pacific, uh, and it's centered on ASEAN. And I won't spell out the whole alphabet soup of, uh, of initiatives and frameworks. It would take longer than the, the uh, allotted time I've got to, to speak. Um, but there are no shortage of these. What, however, their limitation is that they are primarily oriented towards disaster prevention uh, and a, a fairly weak coordination role. I think the real momentum that we've seen has been growing up around the, the side of that, um, both in terms of uh, ad hoc activity between um, uh, Southeast Asian states uh, cooperating bilaterally, and at the broader level, we've got um, the East Asia Summit, which is involved in good work on disaster preparedness. Um, but I'll say a few more words now, returning to this Singaporean initiative of the RHCC which I think is the one to watch, particularly from the military-to-military -military, uh, element of coordinating uh, HADR. Uh, 
The RHCC is, is hosted in Singapore. It's next to the Information Fusion Center. They are co-located both at Changi Naval Base. Um, and it's set up, I think, on the same template. Uh, it's staffed by liaison officers. Um, primarily, it's army-led within the Singapore system. Again, reflecting ultimately the fact that the boots on the ground are the ones who are going to get the job done. Uh, but it is a joint, it's described as a joint facility, but most of the staff there, at least on my experience, are, are uh, army. Um, no foreign assets are assigned to that, so it's, it's slow steps. Um, but nonetheless, it has an impressive level of rollout capability already. Um, the main initiative uh, is a, a common portal, uh, information sharing database, which pulls all kind, pulls in all source data uh, designed to give a, a clear and rapid real-time, or as close to real-time picture uh, of a disaster scene within Southeast Asia. Its operating area is also limited to, to uh, Southeast Asia. It doesn't go wider than that. Um, it arose also, interestingly, in the context of a U.S. ASEAN Defence Summit, the first of its kind, um, in uh, April last year, uh, in which Singapore essentially put up its hand and said, we're, we're prepared to, uh, to run with this as, as our initiative. Um, and that makes it an interesting case because it's, a, it's not officially badged as an ASEAN initiative, but it deals with an ASEAN area and it's hosted by an ASEAN state. And here we get to these sensitivities again about who owns what. If we break down the level of support among other Southeast Asian countries, we actually find a kind of um, uneven picture so far for those who support it. Vietnam is on side, Philippines is on side, Brunei is on side. Indonesia, however, still uh, ambivalent, partly because it hosts a, I quote unquote use the word rival, but there is an element of that ASEAN uh, humanitarian coordination center, the AHA center. Um, and as I said, Vietnam st still has to uh, go over a legal hurdle before it could accept foreign military to operate, even in a disaster scenario. Um, there is, and I'm aware that there's a, a, a representat representative from the UN uh, OCHA office uh, with us today, um, but there's also interest in coordinating with the UN uh, through its uh, disaster relief uh, lead agencies. Um, and also the external um, powers uh, are progressively showing interest. I think China has declared a liaison uh, officer already. Some of those who have a naval liaison officer in the IFC have just cross-hatted, so it's the same person and they are literally across the corridor from one another. I think that's intentionally part of the model. Um, India, I think, will uh, shortly follow, at least that's what I've heard, and Japan has also um, showed interest. But its main challenge, political challenge is the fact that other ASEAN countries will potentially see it as a, a rival. I mentioned Indonesia already, but Malaysia also hosts uh, a, a disaster relief um, uh, pre-deployment um, pre area for supplies at Subang Airport just outside of Kuala Lumpur. So, and Malaysia has also, I think, sat on the fence l largely in its attitude towards the RHC RHCC. But it's early days. It was only set up last year. Uh, and I think the, 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 my view of Singapore, Singapore's approach is the capacity is, is put in up front and then we wait for the others to join and the mission to develop incrementally. And that seems to be the regional cultural approach. What about the role for external powers? Well, um, there is, I think, a clear and, and pressing need to help build capacity. That, that is a whole line of work that it continues through these various ASEAN initiatives that I've lar largely mentioned. And of course, disaster relief is just the, it's the symptomatic response, a lot of the work really can mitigate is done up front in terms of minimizing the, uh, um, uh, the vulnerabilities of, uh, of, of low-lying areas, etc. cetera. Um, and sometimes there will be a need to plug an unbridgeable gap in capacity. There are just limits on how far um, Southeast Asian countries, however they develop, will be able to handle very large-scale uh, severe weather events, probably on an increasing uh, uh, likelihood in future. Um, among the key countries, the United States, of course, stands out in terms of capability and, and experience in HADR, uh, but we also have um, China beginning to show more interest, and I think that's uh, one to watch. 
it suffered negative publicity for its uh, uh, presumed paltry c contribution of a hospital ship belatedly to the um, Haiyan effort. But in the context of the MH370 search, we've also seen a much more proactive uh, stance from China. I think that's certainly a track that's going to develop in future. Um, Japan, too, I should mention, uh, launched its largest ever overseas deployment of the self-defense forces uh, after the United States had, continue, had completed its primary relief mission in the Philippines. Um, there was effectively a kind of relief where the uh, Japanese deployed a very large um, fo force, including some of their new uh, amphibious um, ships. What is the wider significance then to this? And I'll conclude um, on this note. I think, why should we care about Southeast Asia? Do I have to sell it to you? Well, Southeast Asia is a key sub-region, I think, uh, geostrategic in the sense of its central location within the wider Indo-Pacific. Uh, politically also, because in comparison with the other sub-regions, sub South Asia or Northeast Asia, it's the most fluid in terms of its alignment. So in terms of influence building and building government to government and, uh, and uh, uh, defense relations, there are uh, other um, potential benefits to HADR and SAR cooperation. I think in the background that has been the reality that's driven a lot of the engagement. Um, and also, uh, there is no natural hegemon uh, within the sub-region. Indonesia logically should fill that role, but in capacity it's still, uh, although it's, it's, I think, growing in confidence and growing in capability, particularly under the current new administration, um, even showing more signs of a kind of nationalist tone in its foreign policy. But nonetheless, I think Southeast Asia is uh, uh, a kind of uh, natural center to the Indo-Pacific in which these soft forms of military uh, defense engagement uh, have a, a wider strategic significance. Um, and those external powers, I think, they, uh, out of, as a result of their government-to-government -government, um, uh, relations have improved. We saw that very clearly after the 2004 tsunami. Uh, it builds military-to-military -military relations on a, on a non-confrontational uh, basis. Um, there are other spin-offs too in terms of, I mentioned the amphibious ships that Japan had deployed. In terms of the skill sets and capabilities involved to launch an HADR operation up to the point of delivery, there's a very large overlap with uh, conventional um, operations too. So there is a, uh, also that element to uh, defense engagement. Um, plus, it also builds uh, the linkages with NGOs and grassroots um, with the uh, countries affected. Um, so if those governments uh, are not necessarily uh, uh, conducive to external um, military uh, deployments, nonetheless, the, the human connections can facilitate those. Finally, in conclusion then, um, in my view, and it's just a personal view, ASEAN still lacks the depth to be the primary load-bearing vehicle for maritime cooperation within its own region. And I think we see this applying both to HADR and to SAR. But numerous piecemeal strands of maritime cooperation are taking place in the region, uh, and they fit within a, a maritime security template with, I think, in positive implications for improved search and rescue um, responses. MH370, although it hasn't turned up the plane after more than a year, can still be a useful catalyst to harmonize aero and maritime SAR regimes at the global level. Also, the cost-sharing split agreed between Australia and Malaysia, I think, was a, uh, a, a template for how that might be done in future. But I think, however many millions later, um, invested, I think there will also be an effort to multilateralize at a more formal level. Uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean, there was recently an MOU that was agreed on the back of the um, Indian Ocean Region Summit, and I think that's a sign of, of, of where the policy interest will probably go from the Canberra side in future. Um, on HADR, finally, I think the RHCC in Singapore is the, is the military to military initiative to watch depending on its relationship as it develops with the ASEAN uh, AHA Center in Jakarta, and by extension, Singapore-Indonesia uh, relations. Um, and that is complementary to 
the whole other strain of activity through ASEAN, through the ASEAN Defence Ministers Plus network and the East Asia Summit, which sits at the highest level, 18 powers, including all of the major externals, which also has a designated uh, stream of work on, on disaster uh, relief and response. Um, however, I think the RHCC's main limitation is that it's a military-to-military -military interface, and by the admission of its own uh, uh, staff, it's primarily concerned with the first 72 hours. It's a way of trying to get that uh, coordinated ability for ASEAN to be able to move something and avoid, I think, a, a repetition uh, of what happened in November 2013 when a fellow ASEAN member was uh, left instead to make bilateral requests and it was uh, seen to be uh, too little too late. Um, but I think we're on, uh, in, in answer to the question I posed at the beginning, are we on the right track? Um, well, it's always a, a half full, half empty uh, type of answer when it comes to Southeast Asia and ASEAN because it is such a diverse and fragmented region. Um, but I think uh, uh, it is, slowly those steps are happening. And in a broader strategic context, I think we do see uh, a coming together on maritime cooperation uh, slowly along the sort of uh, a, a gentle gradient, um, but it is on the right track. So I'll conclude there and happy to take any questions. Thank you.